Good afternoon, everybody. It is a beautiful day in Baltimore. Outside, inside of here, and up on the screen, that's my hometown. Born and raised here. But before I introduce myself any further, let me tell you about somebody else from our city. She is a particularly wonderful 58-year-old woman and served our city well for over three decades as a school teacher in East Baltimore. But everything wasn't entirely perfect. She had some health problems. She had high blood pressure, she had diabetes, and these two had added up and she had gone into kidney failure and in fact had had to go on to dialysis, which is really actually a pretty terrible way to live. But there was hope. She had been told she was put on the kidney transplant wait list and that if that lottery ticket came through and she got a kidney transplant, she would be restored to an independent, happy, healthy life. The problem for our school teacher and for really all around the country is that there aren't enough kidney transplants to go around. So if you look at the top line in red going to the root, that's the number of people that are waiting for a kidney transplant. And if you look at the much lower flat line in black at the bottom of the graph, that's the number of kidney transplants we do every year. The difference between those two lines, which keeps getting bigger, is how long you have to wait. And the wait can be five or ten years for a life-saving transplant. And that's not just inconvenient, that is a crisis. There are a hundred thousand Americans waiting for an organ transplant. One of them dies every single hour waiting for an organ to go. Oh, hold on. This is 2023. We must have solutions, right? Okay, let's go through some possible solutions for the organ transplant shortage crisis. Well, it sounds easy. Maybe we could just improve donation rates. That's actually much more challenging than it sounds. Now, not enough organ donation. That's not really a medical or a scientific problem. That's more of a communication issue, right? Education and communication. We are lucky in 2023 to have novel, very potent forms of communication in the form of social media like Facebook. So when I went back to my college reunion maybe 15 years ago, I talked to one of my classmates, Cheryl Sandberg who was the chief operating officer of Facebook. And though our attire was kind of silly that weekend, the topic of conversation was serious. Cheryl knew all about the organ transplant crisis because she had written her thesis at Harvard Business School on that topic. So we collaborated on tweaking Facebook's platform to allow you to declare that you were a registered organ donor, that message would go to all your friends, they would have the opportunity to learn more about the topic, and then do the same thing themselves. With that small tweak of the online platform, online donor registration rates went up 20-fold in the United States. That's a pretty good start. Another option in increasing the number of kidneys out there is living donation. So it turns out, we all have two kidneys, you only need one, and donating your kidney is safe. But not everybody on the list who needs one knows that or can easily find a living donor. So that's a communication problem again back to our friends at Facebook. Working with them, we developed an app which you can download for free to your phone, and you could use the app to create a Facebook post, tell your story, what you need to need a life-saving transplant and ask if any of your family or friends would consider becoming a donor. They get the message, they learn more about the process, they maybe even volunteer to be considered as a donor. Folks that use the app were seven times more likely to have a donor come forward in a comparable group that did not use the app. So again, we were maybe making some progress, but the, the problem was by no means fixed. Other possible solutions? Uh, implantable dialysis machines, artificial hearts maybe. Maybe we could use stem cells to rehabilitate damaged organs. Maybe we could be sewing in 3D printed organs. Good ideas, all of these are decades away. And maybe sound far-fetched, well I'll tell you about an idea over the next 10 minutes which may sound equally far-fetched, and that is the use of animal organs to solve the donor crisis. 
That concept is called xenotransplantation. I'm Andrew Cameron, I'm the Chief of Transplant at Johns Hopkins, and I'll tell you about the past of this interesting idea, where we are now, and what the future may hold, and why the future may not be as far off as it initially sounds. All right, wait a second. Now, who came up with this far-fetched idea of using animal organs for organ transplant? And I will readily admit, there are some obvious disadvantages to this concept. Uh, so first of all, um, pigs are very different from humans, and we already know that pig organs will get immediately rejected. They will get hyperacutely rejected on the order of minutes. So that's not good. It's not even really clear whether a pig heart or a kidney will work the same way as an organ we get from a human donor. Uh, you know, there could be infectious risks. We could be transmitting a pig virus to our recipients, but we don't even know the name of it. Um, it's not even entirely clear whether people will accept the use of animals as donors. Now, if you're still willing to listen and participate in the conversation, I would suggest that there are some major advantages to the concept of using animals as donors. So first of all, if we pull this off, uh, there will be an essentially unlimited supply of organs for our sick patients to fill that unmet need forever. In some ways, organs from animals will be selected very carefully from healthy donors, as opposed to the organs we get from people that die and donate the organs that may or may not have been healthy uh, pre-donation. Lastly, uh, in some ways, there will be less of an infectious risk because we know we won't be transplanting the hepatitis B, C, and HIV that we sometimes transmit from our human donors. And then finally, it is now possible to genetically modify animals to make them perhaps particularly suitable for transplanting. Sounds like science fiction. It's actually been done. This is a picture of Dr. Leonard Bailey who shocked the world in 1984 when he transplanted a little girl who came to be known as Baby Faye, shown there, with a heart from a baboon. So she needed a heart transplant. No organs were available. He used a baboon heart. I had the good fortune of meeting Dr. Bailey when I worked in Southern California. And I'll show you this picture of all the little kids whose lives he saved with pediatric cardiac surgery. Now, unfortunately, baby Faye did not survive. She lived only three weeks and her baboon heart was rejected. So yeah, xenotransplant's been done, but not for a long time, because it essentially was a great idea that just didn't work. Xeno was dropped. Until a rather exciting development which took place in 2003, published in the, the journal Science, by my friend David Ayers, shown here on a recent visit to Johns Hopkins. I told you animal organs could be genetically modified, and David Ayers figured out that he could knock out or delete a single gene from pigs that made them very likely to get rejected. That's exciting. So now with organs from these new single gene knockout pigs, Transplants lasted not minutes, but hours. So that was progress, but still not nearly good enough for what our sick patients would need. So the, the bright future of Xeno was again sort of put on hold. It became a running joke in the field of transplantation. What is the future of transplant? It's Xeno transplant, and it always will be. Because we'll always have this high hope, we'll always be looking forward to this bright future, but it's never really going to come. It's just all too unlikely to ever really entirely happen. Until another game changer occurred. This development was far more powerful and really made me the break that Xeno needs, and that's the discovery of CRISPR Cas. Now, CRISPR Cas is kind of complicated, but I can explain it to you in three easy steps. CRISPR Cas is essentially a pair of molecular scissors that bacteria develop to fight off viruses that scientists can use now to very easily manipulate genomes like those in pigs. 
much easier than that first page, which took David Ayer's 10 years. This is all, it's all much better explained in a great book called Code Break, which tells the story of Jennifer Doudna, a scientist at UCAL Berkeley who worked with a team to discover CRISPR-Cas. And here's a picture of Dr. Doudna accepting her Nobel Prize. So we know CRISPR-Cas is a big deal. This may be the game changer we needed back to the pitch. The first pig I told you about from 2003 had a single gene knocked out, and that was a lot of work. With CRISPR-Cas, it was easy to make multiple gene edits. So now we had kids with not one gene edit, but 10 gene edits, so-called 10 gene pigs. And here's a picture of the new pig created by David Ayers down at Riverdale Court, just down the road in Blacksburg, Virginia. And this pig has four genes knocked out to make it less pig-like. And it has six genes knocked in or added to make it more human-like. And I forgot to show you the fourth gene that got knocked out. It had nothing to do with rejection. This was the gene for the growth hormone receptor because it turns out you need to knock that out so that the pig organs don't keep growing and become too large for their human recipients. So it's complicated. I mean, if you're designing a pig, you really have to think of everything. And if this seems, again, too far-fetched, too much like science fiction, this will all probably never happen, I can tell you it's real. It's all real. I have held the 10 GE pig, which will probably be the future of organ transplantation. It's real, and it's real hope for our sick patients. Patients like Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett was a patient down at the University of Maryland, a couple miles down the road, deathly ill, badly needed a heart transplant, couldn't get one, not enough organs to go around, right? About a year ago, the University of Maryland put a 10 GE pig heart into Mr. Bennett. Now, Mr. Bennett was terribly sick on machines and medicines to just give him a blood pressure to sustain his life. The pig transplant worked. I mean, it worked perfectly. Mr. Bennett got better. He got off machines. He got off medicines. Mr. Bennett had to go on medicines to lower his blood pressure. His heart was working so well. And here he is shown a few weeks after his operation with his surgeon, Dr. Clark Griffith, and they're very happy and optimistic, as were we all. I thought Mr. Bennett was going to throw out the first pitch at Camden Yards on opening day. And Mr. Bennett's heart initially worked well, and then it stopped working. And after two months, Mr. Bennett died. But when his heart was very carefully looked at on autopsy, there was no sign of rejection. So not good enough, but that was progress. We have to keep working. So we're working hard and fast down at Hopkins, down at the hospital. And now I'll introduce you to my partner, Dr. Kaz Yamada, shown here in the white coat. Um, he's a bit of a rock star, and like all rock stars, he goes only by one name. He's called just Kaz. And Kaz has been working as a thought leader in xenotransplant for decades. And he studies not only these exciting new donor animals, but he is also working on modulating the immune system of the recipient so that you accept the pig, you don't even fight it, and that's called xenotolerance. Kaz took uh, one of those single gene knockout pigs from 2003 and using xenotolerance, he got that transplant to last not minutes, not hours, but a year. And that was a big deal, and that was published in the journal Nature Medicine. So can you feel that the future is creeping ever closer and closer? It's starting to feel like we are actually getting there. So what is this future and how are, we, how are we going to get there specifically? Well, that's going to be determined by the FDA. The Food and Drug Administration is the governmental agency responsible for giving us permission for xenotransplantation in humans. And COS met with the FDA and they told him that you have to do 10 such experiments and have a certain success rate to get permission to do this work in humans. So there's certainly these critical animal experiments are ongoing. 
This will lead to a human xenotransplant trial that FDA estimates in two years. So the future is almost here. Now, those critical animal experiments are ongoing right now at Hopkins. Okay. Three months ago, my team flew down to Blacksburg, Virginia, procured two 10 GE pig kidneys, flew them back to Baltimore and transplanted them. They work normally like human kidneys. The future is getting close. There are a couple important questions that we need to worry about and figure out over the next two years, however. And the first is we gotta, you know, we gotta be able to do this safely. There are real risks here. We are just getting over COVID, a once in a hundred year pandemic that occurred because a virus jumped from an animal to a human. The government is very interested in that not happening again because of Xeno, as are we all. And I'll call that uh, external regulatory oversight. But I'm also interested in a more individual level, right? So we've talked for about 10 minutes, and maybe I've convinced you that Xeno can be done just because we can do it, should we do it? And I think that is a question more of internal oversight, or the ethics of putting a pig organ in somebody. If it were my sister or my daughter, would I want her to be one of the first to have a pig organ? That is maybe even a more important question. So I'll leave you where we started. It is a beautiful day in Baltimore. And it is a very exciting day because we have novel, powerful technology we are grappling with that may give us the solution to this refractory public health problem that is plaguing our city and our entire country. We are actually getting close. And we are close enough to the point where we are going to struggle with the question now of who goes first. That is a question I invite you guys to help me with, the people in this room. Come down to Hopkins. Come down to the lab. Join in. Help us answer this question. We just submitted a big NIH grant to help us struggle with this question. I can think of one person as a suggestion to start that discussion. A person who could have fallen first is a 58-year-old school teacher who died three months ago on the wait list. Died waiting on dialysis, died waiting for a human organ that never came. We need to work together on this. We need to work together on the science, but also the ethics so we can bring about this bright future for our patients. A future that seemed to be ever slipping away from us is now here. It is right here, right now. Thank you very much.